Welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see to see all of you in this um, virtual space. My name is Dr. Ashley Bachi. I am the um, faculty chair for the Graduate Theological Union's Women's Studies and Religion Certificate Program. And we have started this wonderful series, WSR Speaks. And um, this is part of our um, co co-curricular um, colloquium events that we do that kind of supplement and enhance um, the courses that are offered for the certificate program. And they're open for all and we're so happy to have you here. So just um, a brief intro introduction to the um, WSR program. So it is a program for enrolled GTU students um, at any of the member schools in the master's, PhD, MDiv pro programs. And, and it's for those that want to integrate an intentional um, focus on women's studies and interreligious dialogue, um, theology and religion, and encourages innovative work um, for women um, and those that I, for everyone, not just women, but particular focus on, um, on women's studies and religion. So um, I'm going to put in the chat um, our suggested courses for uh, this semester. So um, we are t offering the WSR seminar this spring. So that is a required course. And I'm also putting in the chat our uh, save the date for our um, spring 22 um, events. So um, I hope that we will be able to see you at some additional events that are, that are coming up. So um, now I want to move to the heart of the of why we are all here today um, we are so happy to um, have with us today a actual a graduate of the gtu and of the women's studies and religion certificate program dr lauren guerra uh, who works at ucla at the cesar chavez department of chicana chicano and central american studies and was the 2016 louisville institute postdoctoral fellow um, so thank you for joining us, Lauren. And I am going to um, begin as um, as we do all of our WR, uh, WSR Speaks um, talks with the question about your thoughts on the continued importance of women's studies and religion more broadly in this particular time, a time of climate change, heightened white supremacy, polarized political and cultural climates, global pandemic, et cetera. Unfortunately, there's, there's kind of a congruence of um, many issues right now um, from your perspective as a Latina theologian. Thank you so much, Dr. Bachi. Thank you for the invitation. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's definitely an honor. Um, as Dr. Bachi mentioned, I'm an alum of GTU, so it's always exciting to kind of be able to participate in events um, and an alum of the WSR program. So, yeah, you know, I think these are really important questions, these are really great questions. Um, you know, um, I still feel that. Um, women's voices are marginalized. I mean, we've come so far in a lot of ways, but when you kind of take a closer look, so like, for example, um, if we think about the pandemic going on, we've seen how it has really affected women in particular, as far as childcare, as far as um, economically, I think the vast majority of people who have been um, on unemployment or things like that have been women, right? So all these factors, of the pandemic have affected women in a particular way. And so, you know, just being able to highlight women's voices is so important. Um, you know, as mentioned, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think, you know, when we think about feminism, what tends to happen is that it tends to focus on, um, you know, like second wave feminism or things like that, you know, when really we can think about feminism across different religions, which looks differently, right? The way that Christians understand their feminism is different than maybe um, the Muslim community, for example. Um, and so I think having those continued conversations are, um, are really important, um, especially in in education, there's many parts of the world where girls still are not able to have access to education. Something so simple that I think perhaps um, 
here in the U.S. that we take that for granted. You know, like um, in general, most girls and young women can go to school without too much problem, but there are parts of the world where that's not an option. And so, um, yeah, I think there's still like so much work to be done. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I forgot to mention this. Um, so the first half we kind of, um, I have some uh, questions for um, Dr. Guerra and then um, the second half is open for Q&A. So if you have questions that come up and you, if you're afraid you might forget them, just put them in the chat um, and then we'll get, we'll address those first. But um, mm -hmm. okay, so um, Dr. Guerra, could you tell us about the course you you mentioned to me that you taught last semester for UCLA on Latinx theology from different religious perspectives and kind of some ways or strategies that you um, used to engage with students that did not have a background in religious studies and how you um, incorporated this feminist lens from a variety of approaches? Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. I have had the privilege of teaching in a lot of different contexts. So for example, like I've taught at Loyola Marymount, which is a private um, Jesuit university. I've taught at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Um, and now I'm teaching at UCLA, which is a major public institution. And I'm teaching in the Chickenex and uh, Central American Studies Department of UCLA. And so it's very different. Right, and so it's been um, a wonderful experience to work with students who are not necessarily trained in religious studies or theology, and yet we're able to have really fantastic uh, conversations about faith and about religion. So for example, um, I've taught a graduate level course called Latinx Spirituality. And what I did was I kind of gave an overview. I gave a panorama of, you know, what does it look like in these different communities, how do these different communities practice their faith? And what is the role of faith in Latinx spaces? And I think in particular for Latinx culture, religion really has a big impact. Christianity um, by far has had a really huge impact on shaping the culture to the extent in which it's almost difficult to, to um, take the two apart, right? It's, it's sort of hard to kind of differentiate, like, is this a cultural thing or is this a religious thing? Because they're so intertwined. Um, and uh, so these classes have been fantastic. My students, for example, have been, um, you know, they're in the social work program or the music department, um, or they're in the PhD in Chicanic studies. So they're coming in with a very different lens and their questions have been fantastic. And it really, you know, because religion is often not spoken about in public spaces, it was a unique opportunity for them to reflect. It was a unique opportunity for them to reflect on their own spiritual lives, for them to reflect on how they were raised, you know, like what were the traditions of their family? So, you know, we would talk about Christianity, we talk about Santeria, to talk about curanderismo and the use of botanicas, like going to these little, um, they're like little stores, like little markets where people go and get, um, like tarot readings or spiritual baths and candles and those kind of things. Um, we looked at Latinx Muslims. We looked at um, Latinx Judaism. I mean, we kind of did like a, a broad overview of these different traditions. And it was really fascinating. Like, um, I think the students really appreciated being able to talk openly about religion and spirituality without judgment. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is that, you know, for many people, they may have had difficult experiences with religion in the past. For example, you know, being forced to go to church or being told, for example, for queer students, being told that their queerness is against God or things like that, right? These kind of, um, this misinformation, um, these very cruel kind of things that happen um, as a result, unfortunately, as a result of certain religious beliefs. And so being able to unpack that in a, in a safe space, um, in an academic setting has been really wonderful. I'm, I, I have to say that I was really honored that two of the students that took my course last quarter are in my course this quarter. So I was like, okay, I must be doing something right. You know, it's, it's exciting. And, um, you know, even right now I'm teaching a course called Barrio Organizing, which is really, it's a service learning course. But what I've done is that I've incorporated readings about, um, religious uh, community organizing. So for example, like, you know, someone like Cesar Chavez, who is very known 
for his work with the farm workers. But what often gets overshadowed is the fact that he was a very devout man. He was a very religious man who fasted and only took communion um, as his only, you know, source of nutrition for, I think one of his fasts was like 25 days. And so things like that, people like that who are really significant, um, but they have a, um, this like religious um, basis for their activism. So thinking about those questions of like, okay, how, what, what does faith-based organizing look like? How has religion played a role in people gathering together, galvanizing, et cetera? Um, and so it's been, it's been good. Yeah, it's, it's been a really um, neat process to, to think about religion's role. And, you know, to be very honest, um, in general, Chicanx studies has had some hesitation with engaging with religion, obviously because of coloniality, right? Thinking about uh, Christianity's uh, colonial kind of um, effects on Latin America and the Caribbean, and rightly so, right? So there's a sense of like hesitation, a little bit of mistrust, you know, towards organized religion, which I totally understand. But what I'm trying to do is kind of say like, okay, it is complicated, right? It is complicated. It's not just black and white. There are, there are actually particular ways in which faith, spirituality, um, what have you, however you want to name it, that they can be very empowering and can be very life-giving to people and can be a source of um, a way of survival. And many of these traditions too, you know, if we think about like indigeneity, these traditions are passed on usually through um, grandmothers and mothers and through oral tradition. And so for, for that fact too, like trying to preserve these rituals and traditions and writing them down and learning more about them and, um, you know, uh, recording those like oral histories, all of that project and that whole process is really important because those, um, those uh, rituals and things will be lost too. You know, and so there's a lot there. There's a lot there that um, it's been really, it's been really exciting to to work with them, um, with the UCLA community. Thank you. And so it's kind of a follow up to that thread. You you just brought up how uh, women end up being kind of carriers of um, of ritual and tradition. Um, and so I'm wondering in the course where you were surveying um, many different religious lenses for Latinx theology, um, how kind of women's voices and feminism, feminist scholarship, um, help to create that, um, a, create a, a kind of container um, for counter oppressive um, understandings and creating safe space. Um, definitely. So for example, like one of the books that we, cover in the class was called um, Latina Evangelicas. And it's a book that's written by um, three uh, Latina Evangelic uh, Evangelica women, um, Loya Marcelo Otero um, and Zaida, her last name's escaping me, but, um, you know, and, uh, you know, these three women have written this book together and they talk about their experience. They talk about the role of the Holy Spirit, um, they talk about, you know, speaking in tongues and all these really interesting things and how faith has been such an empowering part of their lives. And so that was like a great resource, especially in thinking about women's roles, you know. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting how through the power of the Holy Spirit, these women were kind of able to subvert some of the traditional gender roles. Um, so one of the women, for example, um, when she felt called to pastor a particular church, the community was not very accepting at first. And so she's like, okay, we're going to let the Holy Spirit guide us, right? We'll do kind of like a test run for like a month or two, and then we'll check in and see how things are going. And, you know, she's fantastic. She's amazing. And so the community uh, soon like opened up and they accepted her, but it was, you know, for them, it, they, they felt it was the action of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit became something like more subversive. So that is a great, um, a really, really great text that I love. And then um, there's a book by Michelle Gonzalez Maldonado called Embracing Latina Spirituality, which is really great. And she talks about um, prayer and she talks about how um, 
you know, material culture is so much a part of this bridging of, um, you know, passing on tradition. So um, in her case, Michelle talks about how um, a small statue of uh, Our Lady of Charity was passed on from her grandmother to her mother to her. And so that, you know, that statue, it has such a significance, not only for her family, but as Cuban and Cuban Americans, right? Like it's, it's such a rich um, tradition of um, Our Lady of Charity. And so, you know, even myself, my, my um, you know, to share a little bit more personally, my grandmother recently passed away um, about a month and a half ago. And one of the things that was passed on to, to, my, to my mom was my grandmother's niñito. So her nativity, right? Her, the um, baby Jesus and the nativity scene was passed on to her along with um, two beautiful saints that were um, made in Guatemala. And the story goes that um, one of the baby Jesus was saved from a fire. Apparently, like her great grandmother, um, there was a house fire or something, and they saved that they were able to save the baby Jesus. So there's all these stories, right? Like so that comes along with them, um, you know, passing on these traditions. And usually, there's like a really um, beautiful, important story. Um, and even thinking about, um, for example, many of the the migrants from uh, Mexico and Central America one of the things that have often been found by the border or found you know, as items that were kind of lost or left behind were rosaries. You know, People want to cling onto their faith. People need um, something to hope, you know, something to kind of hang on to and to have that sense of hope. So um, these, portable, these portable items, these um, examples of material culture are really, really significant. Um, and for the, actually for the Protestant community, the corritos are very important, the songs, right? So church songs, like songs that were sung in church, um, kids learn them you, when they're growing up, they remember them, you know, it's, um, it's been really beautiful. So for example, like I, um, I'm part of the Hispanic Theological Initiative. And so sometimes, you know, we have gatherings and things like someone will start singing and then a bunch of other people will start singing. they know the song they know this song from childhood you know um growing up in different parts of the country but it, it didn't matter right it was a church song that they were really you know excited to sing it brought back good memories and things like that so that's another example it doesn't have to actually be physical it's just this sense of passing on a tradition um there's been a couple theologians that have uh, called this abuelita theology, so grandma theology, um, in the sense that it is usually passed on through grandmothers and mothers. Um, one person who is really excellent and who has devoted so much time to unpacking this phenomenon is Orlando Espiri. Um, he has written so much on um, U.S. Latino theology, on lo cotidiano, so religion and daily life. Like that's been his um, research focus for many, many years. He's now um, Professor Emerita of um, University of San Diego. So, I mean, if, if people are interested in this topic, like he's an incredible scholar on this. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And could you um, unpack for us a little bit um, you know, um, Mujerista um, theology and then how that might um, kind of support and sustain also this kind of grandma theology that you were just mentioning, um, but then how it might um, be differentiated um, and just some some other access points um, that that you introduce to your students as well as um, through your own work. Um, wonderful. Yes, definitely. So Mujerista theology was coined by Ada Maria Sase Diaz. She was a Cuban American scholar um, who we lost very young. That's a whole nother conversation. There's been so many scholars of color that have passed away very, very young um, with uh, either, you know, diagnosed with chronic illness, um, have passed away of cancer or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's definitely needs to be a conversation about health and um, academia, how sometimes it can be uh, a bit uh, taxing and, um, not really good about self-care in general. So that's a kind of a side note. Um, so yes, so she wrote Mujeres of Theology. She was very focused on thinking about grass, what she calls grassroots Latinas. 
So she's really thinking about just kind of like your average woman, you know, like your, your mom, you know, your sister, your cousin, your auntie, just your regular Latin, you know, Latina, Latin American woman, and really giving uh, value or pointing out the value in their perspective, in their voice. So she did a lot of, um, I guess you could call ethnography work. You know, she would talk with different women and record their stories and get to know them. Um, she was very much a woman with her feet on the ground. Like she would definitely be part of, um, you know, uh, picket lines and protests and things like that, as far as like supporting um, women's rights and, and I believe, yes, if I'm not mistaken, she was also very active with women's ordination. She was very much part of the women's ordination movement um, in, uh, in trying to get women ordained in the Catholic church, which still has not happened, uh, unfortunately. Um, and, and then, you know, there's also this juxtaposition, something very interesting that happened. Um, we have Maria Pilar Aquino, who was really focused on Latina feminist theology. And to be honest, they kind of uh, butted heads, you know, in academic, in academic circles, like they kind of disagreed on which term was more effective. So Maria Pilar Aquino, um, she focused on Latina feminist theology because she wanted to bridge the gap and kind of, um, align herself with this broader feminist movement. She argued that, you know what, we're talking about feminism, we're talking about the feminists, plural, um, across the globe, working together, uniting, you know, lifting up voices. And so she uh, didn't find the mujerista term to be adequate. She preferred Latina feminists. So that was definitely kind of um, a, a rift there for, for a bit. Um, in the end, they kind of, um, you know, as, as things go, like they kind of reconciled and we're like, okay, you know, like we can have both terms. It's, you know, it's fine. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's, it, it's interesting that um, we have kind of um, those two different takes on, on uh, the, you know, in terminology as far as like naming. And that's the other thing too, is like naming oneself is so important. That's something that Ada Maria, that's why she picked Mujerista because Mujer means women. Mujer means woman in Spanish. So that's actually why she picked Mujerista as her term because it's all about naming oneself. And so, um, yeah, those are just kind of like the two paths that were, um, were forged as far as like Latino theology. Thank you so much. You know, we see that um, similarly within, um, you know, black feminism versus womanism, um, these terms. And, and unfortunately it's, it's because of this um, history of first and second wave um, feminism being so enmeshed with really white middle class um, identity and the pushing out of um, the the um, the views and concerns of um, of anyone else that doesn't fit that category and so it's it, it feminism can be very um, can tap into a lot of trauma um, for a lot of um, a, a lot of scholars that are um, where they have felt that they've been um, not recognized or, or had a voice. And so I, it's, I think that it's really important to, um, to lift up how those, um, that naming um, issue is, um, it taps into something. It's not, it's not superficial. It's, 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 a, it's a very um, important discussion that always has to be had within women's studies and religion. Um, and, and I identify as an intersectional feminist um, and, um, and it, it's part of that as, as someone that's a cisgendered uh, white woman, um, I have to um, grapple with the fact that feminism is, is, has a very, um, a very privileged, um, I'm, I'm coming from a very privileged position um, in being able to use that term without, um, without kind of flinching um, as, as many of my um, colleagues that may may feel um, and so that's that's really the the work of um, of white intersectional feminists is to to own that history um, and to to combat it right so um, to to make sure that we're not perpetuating that same um, cycle of of silencing um, 
And just one last piece, because you've given us so much knowledge and so many, um, so many pieces of wisdom um, that I'm gonna have to like watch it on slow um, to get all these names of everyone. And um, and I'm definitely gonna be using it in the WSR seminar um, this spring. So thank you so 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 much. Um, I'd like to um, just hear a little bit um, before we open it for Q and A, um, just of where you kind of um, find that. Um, that wellspring of um, of self care. You you mentioned earlier um, how um, academia is draining, and I think that um, that those of marginalized identities, which um, women as well as religious minorities, every every kind of marginalized identity within academia, um, there's a there's a toll that happens in just breaking in. You know, I I um, I feel that myself as one of six kids who was the first to finish undergrad and um, the pressure that then is put on you, um, you know, in, in finishing and, you know, and there's, there's all of these different layers that'll come from um, various identity points. And um, I'm wondering for, you know, if you might share when you were um, teaching this material, you know, last semester that covers such a range um, I'm sure that that there's various points that can be very draining. I know I know that from my own teaching. And so, um, just to to end, if there if you have any um, suggestions or strategies for when you're dealing with um, such a, a variety of topics, um, how how you hold space in a way that um, promotes self care for yourself as well as for your students in in holding that space. Yeah, you know, like some of these topics can be very uh, draining, they can be triggering, you know, for example, like I covered um, Nancy Pineda Madrid's book, um, Salvation, Suffering and Salvation in Ciudad Juarez, which talks about the feminist side in Ciudad Juarez, you know, which continues to this day. It's extremely graphic. It's horrible. I mean, it's um, the mutilation and killing uh, of these women is unsolved. It is unsolved. And the state doesn't seem to care, you know, um, which is really horrific. And interestingly enough, um, I had one student, well, I mean, it's it's pretty uh, heartbreaking. A couple years back, I had a student who shared with me that they lost a loved one in this way, that they, you know, it was a direct connection. So that was very painful. And I tried to, you know, talk with a student and, and be there for them. But, you know, I had no idea. But um, the things that come up, right? And um, this past uh, quarter, I used the book again. And um, a student of mine, this is actually her main research topic. She's actually spent time in Mexico City and spent time um, kind of looking at the laws, right? Like the laws, like are there laws in place protecting women? Are they even enforced? And what she found is that they're not even enforced, right? There are laws in the books, but it, it's never, um, it seems as though that the perpetrators are never caught there's never any justice and these families are still you know seeking justice um and she talked a lot about performance art as a way of healing it was really fantastic um the the type of research that she's doing but right so some of the, this is a kind of a long way to say it can be very traumatizing it can be very draining um i am a big proponent of mental health I think that's one of the major lessons that we can take away, mental and physical health, of course. Um, that's one of the major lessons of the pandemic. It really pushed people to the edge. For a lot of folks, it really brought up a lot of trauma, a lot of issues. Um, I, you know, I see a therapist regularly. I'm not ashamed of that because I think all of us have things to work through. Um, taking care of one's body. I mean, I, I try my best, you know, to drink water, to eat fairly healthfully, to try to get eight hours of sleep, like those things which seem um, sort of unexciting, but they really, you know, when you put them together, they help with um, a sense of like a holistic health, you know, also like getting some activity, like a little bit of exercise a couple of times a week is important too, right? Um, because we are whole people, we are body, mind, and spirit. And that's one of the things that I think, you know, I've had to learn the hard way that when you neglect one side of yourself, 
it becomes a problem. It, it's your, um, when we neglect one side of ourselves, it, it forces, um, it like our, um, our body, our spirit, our mind finds ways to get our attention, right? If you ne neglect it for long enough, it will find a way to get your attention, right? And also like not letting things go. For example, that tooth that's bothering you or that backache or, you know, my annual visit to the doctor, right? Those kind of things, like keeping up with those things. I know it's been, again, super difficult because of the pandemic, you know, um, keeping those wellness visits. But that's part of it too, is like keeping just a, a general sense of wellness. And, um, and finally, I've had to learn how to say no. You know, like I've had to learn how to say no to things that to be honest, just don't serve me. It's like, I'm sorry, like I cannot volunteer to write this piece. No, I cannot volunteer to do this. I cannot, you know, because time is precious, but that's actually you know, as much money as one can have, that's the one thing that we can never get more of. You can never really purchase more time or more, you know, more days um, in a month or things like that. Like it's, our time is actually so sacred. And so I've been very adamant about protecting my time, saying no to things that I don't think are going to be helpful or serve me in any kind of way. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm good about like, you know, wrapping up work at a decent hour. Like I'm not going to stay up to 1 a.m. grading anymore. I'm sorry. Um, things like that. Right. So um, that's kind of a lot of those kind of a lot of different things um, wrapped up together as far as like how I try to take care of myself and stay centered and, you know, making time for friends and family, you know, not, not being a workaholic, I think is also an important thing. It's very, very easy in academia we're almost programmed, right? We're almost programmed to be workaholics. Um, and so um, that's, you know, finding, finding ways to make, you know, finding ways to have a, like a more well-rounded lifestyle, I think is really critical. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And just to say, yes, um, emotional and mental health is so important. I also see a therapist regularly and it's um, unfortunately um, mental health has been stigmatized um, to discuss. And I think that that's a place in which um, feminist spaces, especially do tend to um, have more of um, a holistic um, view around um, not only our bodies and everything, but about community. And so that becomes a space in which um, we can start the destigmatizing um, de um, mental health, especially for those that um, are in um, academia. I think that that's, it's very important. Um, because there are a lot, especially if we teach a lot of heavy material, as you were mentioning, um, we need to be able to, um, to, to foster self-care. So thank you so, so much, so much, so much. Um, such a wonderful talk. I'm going to open it up now um, for Q&A from, um, from our guests. Um, so um, you feel free to put questions in the chat. It's also, you can... Um, you can just jump in um, to ask questions, raise hand or um, however you feel comfortable. So. Yes, I see a hand, Laura, would you, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm, um, it's so nice to um, be in this conversation and to hear um, to hear your voice, Dr. Professor Guerra. Um, and I, um, many people have told me about you. So this is the first time that I've actually got to um, hear straight from you. Um, so I am a second year um, MTS student at the Jesuit School of Theology. I'm also an art therapist with Homeboy Industries. And this is my topic that I'm um, been focusing on um, for my capstone project and hopefully further. Um, I've been um, not only looking into this area, but some of the research I'm just about to begin is, um, and so I was wondering, um, you, you sort of touched on a little bit, so I wanted to hear more on it. Um, women who have been um, um, cut off from faith, 
it, that's sort of the area that I'm looking at, which um, if you know anything about homeboy industries, then you would know that we're um, dealing with uh, former gang members and, or women who were with former gang members um, and or it could be both. So religion and traditional faith, I have found um, in my five years of um, doing art therapy with them, um, religion or traditional faith, even the altern, you know, even even alternative faiths that Maharista theology or um, any of the other um, Latinx theologians might speak of may not even imply that these could be women who just have not had any experience or any exposure to any kind of religion at all. And that's sort of my interest. So I was wondering maybe, you know, if you can shed some insight or if you know of any studies or books on that, um, I would love to hear that. So thank you. Thank you, Laura, good to meet you. Um, yes, I'm familiar with Homeboy Industries. Um, Father Greg Boyle is fantastic. Um, he, you know, he, he's really, done incredible things and served a lot of people. So that's really super awesome. Um, so yeah, so I'm trying to get a sense of, um, so you're kind of asking, I'm trying to just um, kind of understand the question. Um, so you're asking about women who may not have had any exposure to religion and like what resources there might be. Is that kind of? Right, women who, who have not had any formal um, or any, or formal or informal exposure mm -hmm. to faith and are just coming into it now as adults as maybe as a part of their recovery I see I see so, yeah sorry I probably left that part out which yeah. is which is it was sort of what the women are experiencing here in my you know from what I've been able to um observe yeah um or, or maybe you could email me or I could email you. Sure, you yeah. So um, one group that I can think of is Mujeres de Maiz. They're here in Los Angeles. Um, they're like a, a nonprofit organization. They do have a lot of um, like events and things that are spiritually based um, that might be helpful. You know, and, and as far as like Christianity goes, I really, you know, one of the things that I find so fascinating is that, you know, you can go to one church and have a beautiful experience, you know, the, the message is spot on, it's uplifting, it's wonderful, and then you can go to another church two miles away, and it is totally devastating, totally negative, so I mean, I think that's, I think that's one of the challenges, it's like, I always, I don't know, I mean, I always encourage people to, for lack of a better word, shop around. You know, I encourage people to shop around as far as like finding a good um, home, right? Finding a place where you feel spiritually welcome, where you feel spiritually safe, I think is, um, is so important. Um, yeah, I'll have to think a little bit more on like other potential like resources and things like that, but thank you. Let's see. Thank you. I see a comment by um, Joy, women Joy. are often marginalized in the U.S. culture. Academia is not unique, nor are religious studies. How can we bring women together to bring a feminist critical perspective to all areas of our lives beyond the stereotypical? Um, great. Um, and hi, Joy. Oh, that's so sweet. I was your TA. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Yay. Oh, you're the WSR alumna. Cool. Perfect. Awesome. So welcome, Joy. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, you know what? Like, I think that's one of the challenges. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that sort of like as we start subdividing groups, how do we then work together, right? So for example, it's like, oh, you know, this is a Black women's group. This is a Latina women's group. This is a group for trans women. This is a group for, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera it gets really challenging. It's like, okay, what can we work on together? What are, you know, what are some ways that we can work together? What are some of the intersections, like Dr. Bachi was saying, being intersectional, what are some of the intersections that we can 
kind of weave things together and help each other out. Because when you look more closely, these, these issues are interconnected. You know, it is interconnected. You know, these are um, issues with pat patriarchy, issues with misogyny, racism, classism, all those things. They're, they're not disconnected. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, if, if someone knows how to answer this question, you will like create world peace. I mean, I don't know, you know, like I, I really don't know um, what the best way would be to go about it. Um, yeah, alas, I think that is one of the biggest uh, sufferings that we have right now is just disconnection, disconnection. I think a lot of people just feel disconnected, disenfranchised, um, disappointed you know, um, and not, not feeling like they have um, support or community and things like that. Um, I do have to say, I mean, thankfully for, um, you know, for the, what is it? Um, social media has its pros and its cons, but one of the pros of social media is that you can easily, you know, go on Facebook and find a Facebook group of, you know, um, people who are focused on the environment or people who are working on this voting rights, et cetera, right? Like it's um, through Instagram, Twitter, you know, we can find information, we can connect with other people globally, right? It's not even just um, in our like local city or state, we can actually connect globally to other folks. So that's one of the pros of social media that we can um, make those connections. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, Joy wrote, um, I think just being willing to learn and work on, quote, obvious issues may get us started. I like the idea of working on projects with folks with similar interests. Mm -hmm. and I would just say conversations, you know, like just listening to one another and active listening, not listening to think about how we're going to respond or what question we're going to ask or, you know, how this relates to me, but like really listening to each other's stories in a way that we don't um that doesn't erase our differences but we can find commonalities and we can find points of intersection about what we're passionate about and how we might be able to bring different solutions to the table um you know i do a lot of community organizing um i'm involved with this group true north it's a it's a, a pico affiliate and it's a, um, a very wide, diverse um, group of people from very um, different religious traditions. And um, I myself, I'm secular, so I'm not um, identified with one um, religious tradition, but it, it's, it's that finding community in wanting to work towards making a just and sustainable community. Our, how do we make our community better? And that is something that isn't like, um, that's something we should all want, right? So, you know, when we're thinking, if we, if we go to the microcosm of just our town, just our city, um, and then we kind of branch out, then we tap into um, to larger notes. I know that for myself, it's been extremely life-giving, especially, you know, I was with a group before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, when there's been so many times of feeling completely helpless and to meet monthly um, with these people that were, were working on um, the issue. Uh, I particularly focus on housing as I, I myself was unhoused at one time. And, and to, to reconnect, to remember that I'm, I'm not the only one that cares. Um, and that that can be just, that can be that light that sometimes you just need to, to not feel siloed. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that that's, and was something that, um, that Dr. Garrett was bringing up, you know, the insights that she brings into our classroom are not relegated to one religious perspective, right? You know, and so, um, so opening it up to just find, find these threads that can be woven together into a beautiful tapestry um, that support, support us in the work. Uh, so I see, um, Joy also writes, food is a good start. What foods mm -hmm. do we enjoy and want to eat together? Yeah, food is always great. And then Laura writes, in my art therapy groups with women at Homeboy, we often make crabs that incorporate food. So agreed. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, I definitely think that food is um, a nice way to 
get to know, you know, different cultures and, and share things. And I think it facilitates um, also like sharing of stories because usually it's like, oh, like this is my grandma's paella or this is my aunt's macaroni salad that she makes every Christmas or whatever. You know, it, it facilitates kind of the sharing of um, experiences and stories. So I think it's, yeah, food, who doesn't love food? You know, like it's, it's great. <laughs> Yes, Diane. Great. Um, I was wondering if you could offer, I love how you name the challenge of the ex inclusive and exclusivism around the understanding or perceptions around feminism. And I wonder if you could give some imagination to strategies, maybe starting with within Latin culture, but also beyond. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I have to say, right, like as as the years progress, we um, let's see. I feel like our challenges evolve as time goes on, right? So the challenges that we were facing in the '50s have morphed into something different, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, um, as far as inclusivity, you know, it's well, creating spaces is challenging because by defining one space, it automatically is creating a division or is, is saying, I am this, I am not that, right? And so I think um, it's, yeah, I think it's very, I think we're in a really difficult space as far as like, building bridges um, because I think more and more people are trying to differentiate themselves, you know, and, and people are resisting labels and don't want labels. And so it just, it's kind of, it, it becomes a challenge. It's like, okay, you know, um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just kind of, I, I think it's, it's getting, it's, I think it's actually getting harder to get people to kind of agree upon certain things. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing to me that we have still, there's certain, in my mind, there's certain basic things that we still cannot agree upon as a society. For example, like clean, clean drinking water, universal health care, those kind of things. Like we just, for whatever reason, we cannot agree on these very basic things. So how on earth are we going to work together? You know, it's just very, it's becoming, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to get folks to work together and to see past any differences. Um, in other words, like how do, how do we work towards a common good? Like what does the common good look like? Um, something that is, um, like welcoming something that is helpful, you know, that does the most good, that is the most just for the most amount of people, right? Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I wanna be hopeful, but I also see like a lot of um, challenges. Yeah, um, something that I always include in my syllabi is um, this quote from Audre Lorde, Without community, there is no liberation, only the most vulnerable and temporary armistice between an individual and her oppression. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. Um, and I think that, you know, the, one of the problems, you know, actually with, you know, how there's trauma around even using the word feminism for many is because that includes that that discussion around inclusivity has often meant then that it's still that dominant white middle class representation becomes you know and everything else gets subsumed it's kind of like that melting pot piece right um and so um so i think that you know we we are facing so many challenges right now and there's so much that um that we can learn from the differences, from different approaches. So we shouldn't be, in in my opinion, and, and again, this is, you know, from my space as a cisgendered white interdisciplinary and intersectional feminist, my opinion is what, you know, I bring certain things to the table based on my identity and that can only get me so far, 
that can get me to one set of questions. Um, but I'm going to learn so much from you, Dr. Guerra. I'm going to learn so much from um, Dr. Rita Sharma. I'm going to learn from, you know, all of these things are going to, um, sorry, those are my talks. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's only so much where our um, personal identities and life experiences can take us um, because that, that's, you know, we're human, right? Um, so as long as we don't feel um, siloed in that and we're open to learning from others without then thinking that that is also our identity, right? So how do we, that I think is where it gets, um, where the rub is in a way, you know, how do we, um, how do we learn from one another without then uh, falling into this, uh, a co-opting, right? So how do I, you know, how do I incorporate liberation theology and mujerista theology, womanist theology? How do I incorporate that in my, in my teaching um, in a way that I feel like helps me as an intersectional feminist um, create just and, and just and sustainable community, but in a way that is, doesn't, you know, doesn't place me at the center. Um, and, you know, and so, um, so I think that what's, uh, you know, amazing and what, you know, previously just to know that this WSR Speaks um, idea for this one came out from, you know, um, uh, Dr. Garrett and I having lunch over at, at SBL um, and her telling me about this um, amazing course that she taught, you know, where she was um, talking about a Latinx theology from different religious perspectives. And I think that that's, you know, often um, we think kind of a Catholic, um, Catholic theology. We hear theology and we think of white Catholic theology, just as we, um, some people might hear feminism and they think white middle-class feminism. And so um, I think that that's, um, that bringing all those things together so that students and all of us know that that's not the case, right? That we know that feminism isn't, isn't just this and that theology isn't just this and how to, so I see Laura's hand. Yes, but I'm sorry though you were stating that so beautifully, so I would like put it back down. <laughs> oh no 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 no! Please, <laughs> I've talked about. Um, you know the conversation that uh, is being had right now. It really, um, I wanted to share. You know, I uh, on that topic, I have really learned a lot from um, the um, the who is now the department chair of clinical art therapy, Dr. Lavinia Jackson. Um, who's an art therapist um, that I, you know, is from my program um, in my training here in LA. And she has written a book um, on, and I've attended her workshops on art therapy and cultural humility. And of course the um, art therapy component, you know, may not apply to this conversation, but the cultural humility aspect of it, which is really a methodology or an approach really that's just kind of sort of coming into the literature beyond where it started in the medical community of how to, how to, um, really understand and connect like the relational connection of learning from other cultures um, as a lifelong practice. And there's a lot written on that now. It really was a turning point for me as I was beginning to engage with um, people that were very different from me or similar to me or that I wanted to learn from. Um, and so that, you know, I just, she's a very, and she's a wonderful, um, Dr. Jackson, and she's an African American woman, so she has a very broad perspective on this as well. So, I, if you have not heard of her, I would look that up. Or, or I wonder if any of you have heard, have engaged with cultural humility um, or that as an it's it's a. Would you mind, Laura? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, putting in the chat um, sure. link. That okay. would be really helpful. Um, thank you. I myself have not, so I'm going to look into that. Um, it reminds me thinking about, um, you know, a hermeneutic of suspicion guided by love, um, right? So, um, so that's what that it kind of taps in for me as far as my, as my experience from from what you're describing. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say, yes, um, caringness and love is and compassion is sort of like at the heart of it. Um, um, I wrote a paper on it as well at JST, but I will put in that information. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Um, Gera, if you could um, just 
if you have a parting wisdom, we have five minutes left and I'm just, um, there's so much that you talked with us about. Um, and even in the beginning, it was almost like it went um, too fast. So it was like, we have so much that we can unpack from all of the, um, the wisdom that you were sharing with us. Um, so, I mean, I would just love in these few minutes that we have left to um, hear about, you know, the women um, and the stories that have inspired you in your path um, in, in women's studies and religion and, um, and in your path and as being um, a, a Latina theologian, right? So, so where are your, um, your kind of heroes that you might um, share with us and, um, and where you gain inspiration and so that you can be an inspiration to others? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you know, um, oh, I wanted to acknowledge really quick Diane's comment um, that she has a friend who's a curandera. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's really about learning from others. I think that, um, you know, that's how we grow. But there has to be an openness. I think that's critical. That's part of, um, you know, that's part of it is having this openness to learning, to feel, you know, to, to recognize that we don't have all the answers. Um, yeah, and so give me one second. <laughs> Pardon, I'm battling a, a terrible cough, so I didn't want to um, cough on camera. Um, let's see. So, yeah, as far as people who've inspired me, um, you know, I will forever acknowledge uh, Michelle Gonzalez Maldonado. She really was the one who encouraged me to do doctoral work. Um, she taught at Loyola Marymount when I was a, um, an undergrad. And so she was really the one who encouraged me to pursue the PhD. Um, and then, you know, I, I have so many academic mentors, you know, um, I would, you know, I mentioned Michelle, I'd mentioned Cecilia Gonzalez, Andrew Yu. She's also a fantastic, um, Cuban American scholar. She focuses primarily on theological aesthetics. So she really taught me so much about art and beauty and, and things like that. And she was um, such a fantastic help when I was writing my dissertation and things like that. Um, and then, you know, I would have to say just um, like family members, you know, I would say like my, for example, like my grandmother, she's the one who taught me Spanish. You know, she's the one who taught me Spanish. She um, showed me how to play this um, game called Loteria. And so that's how like I learned like a couple different fan, um, different Spanish words. Um, and there was always a deep sense of faith. She always, ha always had deep sense of faith. She had her little altar set up, you know, in the living room um, with the baby Jesus and the saints and the candles and everything like that. And so I always, yeah, like I always think of her as a woman of, of great faith. And then also my mother too, my mom, you know, that's the one thing she'll always constantly tell me is Lauren, have faith. She's like, have faith. You have to believe, you have to pray, you have to, um, you know, ask God for guidance and things like that. And um, it's funny, growing up, um, you know, it's it's so interesting. Like, so I, I was raised Roman Catholic, but my, also, my mom is also very much open to things like astrology you know she it's so funny so this is something i find really funny there was um a really famous astrologer um in latino culture named um, walter mercado and his predictions would come on i think at the end of the evening news and both of my grandmothers were fanatically obsessed with walter like if walter was on giving you know the astrology forecast everyone better be quiet because it was very important times and so my mom occasionally, you know, if um, there's like different um, astrologers talking about the signs and things like that, my mom will like tape my sign. She'll like tape my Aries prediction and send it to me as a video. It's the most hilarious. I find it very sweet and very hilarious. Um, so she's open to that kind of stuff. And I've, I've even kind of dabbled in, you know, reading tarot and things like that. So this is a long way to say that, um, spirituality is very complex. Like a person's religion and spirituality is very complex. Um, 
you know, we've gone to curanderas before and, you know, I've done limpias and things on myself with an egg to try to kind of wash away negative energy. Again, like these are things that I would never have year, like a few years ago, I never would have shared this. I would have thought that, oh, it's like, you know, you're a theologian, you're an academic, like you shouldn't talk about that stuff. I was like, oh my God, but this is so much part of my culture. Like these, um, these practices of going to a curandera, um, you know, botanicas, all those things are very much a part of my culture. And so I've started to share it a little bit more, but um, yeah, no, I think, um, I think the biggest thing is to continue the search. I think that would be my biggest kind of piece of wisdom is to continue the search, you know, to find the things that make your heart feel joy, you know, to find the communities that are supportive, um, to continue to seek light, you know, to continue to seek happiness and light um, in your life. And that, you know, that can be a process sometimes. Like as we grow and change, um, as life happens, you know, um, something that worked five years ago, maybe doesn't work now, that kind of thing. But I think just being open to, um, to learning, to being open to growing, I think is so important. Thank you so, yeah. so much. And we did have a request for how um, people might reach you. So if you could put your contact information. Sure. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the wisdom that you imparted with us, for being open and honest. Um, and I know that um, it's it, it was a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic way to spend a lunch hour. Um, and um, yes, I look forward to, to seeing you and your work again in the future. Um, and I hope that everyone here is, um, feels as fulfilled and sustained um, by the wisdom that we were given by Dr. Guerra today. So thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank yes, you for having me. Day. Have a good day. Bye.